of all, the high school for the opportunity. I want to thank you for your kindness and your attention. During this talk, I will propose a perspective <coughs> analysis between culture and imperialism and beginnings, say its first autonomous publication, reconsidering some peculiar aspects of it, or say its fault, which came to fulfillment and maturity in culture and imperialism. And your keywords are obviously philology and career. And starting from Said's return to philology, in fact, they will linger upon the epistemological and ontological values of text and career, considered or reconsidered as sides of power and resistance. Philology has become in some way a fundamental issue of Saidian criticism, thanks to the recent success of uh, humanism and democratic criticism. Instead, career is more problematic and in some way even neglected. And let me uh, shortly recapitulate its history, starting with a brief meditation on beginnings. The issues at stake in beginnings involve two topical paths. The first regards Said's assimilation of Vico's historicism within his criticism of hegemony, his interdisciplinary conception of textuality, counter memories, archives, his assessment of neglected histories and within the analysis of tradition and disciplines following its militant and engaged commitment, peculiarly concerning the renewal of Western humanistic canon. The second issue is the concept of authority. Say it underlined how in modernism, due to the socio-economic upheavals of the 19th and 20th century, the form of the representation of narrative realization are contingent upon the wish, legitimated by the same time abused, by the authorial consciousness of the author's self edification his own historical time, a mimetic will of the vital processes of birth, growth, and death, which entangled a radical change in the modalities of its representation. The ancient case <coughs> fully showed the complex development of reality along literary narration that shattered itself against the psychological people of modernity. And such a clash then shifted the narrative attention towards a most extreme and rarefied subjectivity. <laughs> After Vico and through Freud and Auerbach, such evaluation of the importance and the essence of modernism, considered as a humanly historical, a psychological, and literary event, posits the issue of beginning according to a double perspective of authority and molestation. The first term regards writing as a creative act of projection of will onto reality which is Vico's beginning intention, that allows the unpredictable realization of man's history in opposition to the immutable divine origin. The second molestation presents a new hermeneutic problem because it means abuse or molest in the sense that when the writer's consciousness confronts itself with the responsibilities and duties of its authorial power, it forces the writer both as a subject and as a perpetrator of the abuse, to realize the narrative limits of the novel as genre and its illusory representation of reality, and it instills a fundamental doubt about the actual possibilities of historical realization that authority allows us beginning. Throughout the book, Said analyzes some great modernist novels through this double perspective, searching for the inner struggles which made those texts possible. These struggles are the intimate and psychological explication of the dramatic intercourses between authority and molestation because they are the proper, and quoting, roots of the fictional process which inevitably <coughs> characterized and influenced the text. That is, they become its propulsive source, concretizing in the writer's self the intention to write exactly that text. The ways in which those texts are written, epitomize the transformation of novel as representation of reality, the radical shift in the intercourse between writing and will, and the people in the subject perception of human history. According to say, such a transformation derives essentially from those maniacal obsessions of some capital authors for their techniques of writing and realization, obsession obviously rooted in those dramatic inner struggles but which are the technical, techno ethical conditions of the career, of this career. In a footnote of beginning, say writes that one rarely finds, however, an English language critic asking where a text takes place, or how it takes place. In fact, 
he wants to underline the will to political power transpiring from the career considered as the ontological project of an author through his public and private works. Such a conceptualization of this social psychological authorial tension could be viewed through the geohistorical perspective of Antonio Gramsci and Eric Auerbach. Mutatis Mutandis has a profound homology between the authorial will of the writer, considered as the legitimation of his representation of the world, and the intellectual's will to hegemony, considered as the uh, legitim legitimation of his Weltanschauung. Modernity has modified the relationship between text and writing, and the text, far from being any more a simple object to be created, she became the simulacrum of the writer's perpetual <coughs> struggle to live up to his career, because writing itself became an effort in self-realization following an ontological becoming and not simply an existential animal. And at the same time, the intellectual could no longer consider theory and practice as an theory as an interpretation of reality sustaining a praxis for the change of society because it became the interest of Hill's self-edification as author and as a subject within the hegemony, the dominant hegemony, or any, a kind of hegemony. The synthesis between theory and practice would have occurred then as the assimilation of one's own Weltanschauung within the dominant hegemony according to the historical becoming of the interest which lay beneath. Career as then a double nature from a personal point of view. It is a union between the author's production of text and the author's representation projected by those texts, and at the same time, from an ontological point of view, it is a, an extended conception of text. It is the whole discursive order of a peculiar theoretical situation, much more complex than that single act of will which undertook the endeavor, so to say. Here, the question is how to understand the perpetual rule of coherence and implementation on this background of the author's subject self edification And virtually, as Said explains, it is the interplay between real life and writing career. They are fundamentally oppositional because of their antagonistic nature, but they has to be called rigorously into question by criticism. And any kind of interpretation must return the ethical elaboration that he quotes from Gramsci of the creative act and the alpha ontological nature as a determined subject. These techno-ethical conditions of the writing <coughs> career have to be analyzed as fundamental issues of the ontological project of intellectuals inside the historical becoming of contemporary post-colonial, post-imperial, and above all, transnational consciousness. Such an operation could be afforded only through a decisive evaluation and a careful appreciation of the scholar's own ethical attitude, both as expert or as an intellectual amateur, of the implied methodologies and of the social and political <coughs> condition of writing as an own culture. But how to inquire these sites of power and resistance? Said's critical philological readings in culture and imperialism recover the traces of the historical process, in particular sites, revealing the existence of a more general imperial cultural model. The problem is that concepts like Orientalism and Occidentalism have not been built on real events. Instead, they refer to congenitally labile discursive fields. They are myths subjected to thousands of ceaseless influences and actualization according to the will to political, intellectual, and social power of every new nation, interest, and hegemon involved in the historical becoming. Said states that these myths are not simple misrepresentation of factual realities. Instead, they are subtle, special preconceptualization of the hegemonic logic. There is not any real Orient or West. Such representations earn their overdriving status just because they are objectification of something without concrete history, and therefore they can be used to do to state such things. These historical concepts become knowledge just when they are powerfully used to state something. Hence, the intellectual has the responsibility to figure out what kind of representation they are 
which kind of role they had and from and in which side they gained their mythological status. The study of the relationship <coughs> between sex and the gallery, proposed by Said in Culture and Imperialism, has been the most effective result of what could be defined as biological synthetic method of inquiry. Borrowing the first instances of such a method from Vico and Dauerbach, it relied precisely on text as fundamental sites of our <coughs> realization in history, as proper events and not simple moments of literature in human history. At the same time, they fulfilled this contrapuntist perspective in the analysis of authors, texts, and social geographical contexts that have been lacking in Orientalism, and as a matter of fact, even in Orientalism. <coughs> the beginnings, and as a matter of fact, even in Orientalism. <coughs> when Said's critical elaboration met the Gramsci factor, as he stated in an interview in Power Politics and Culture, the inventory of the traces of the historical process became more a human than an intellectual exigency, a true living philology of the secular reality. Said entangled his philological assumptions of Vico, Auerbach, and Gramsci with his traditional humanist Bildung and his exilic biography, and the need to confront the relations of production in power <coughs> and culture with the hegemonic will of the empires and the struggle for resistance of subalterns found an immediate critical response in a different reading of literary masterpieces in a different assumption of the subaltern text throughout the history of colonization and imperialism. <coughs> the final result was a personal dimension which radically characterized Said's praxis as a <coughs> secular intellectual attitude, a philological method of inquiry, and a genuine vocation to criticism. For instance, in the chapter Consolidated Vision, Said focuses on the relations between power and culture, willingly or unconsciously masked behind the literary canon. And as for what regards the inner and psychological relation between writing and reality, in culture and imperialism, Said wrote about Austin, Camus, Conrad, Berthe, Flaubert, and Kipling, because in their careers he found those traces of the historical process. <coughs> pointing to the existence of that more pervasive imperialistic cultural model, which was universally embedded in all those civilized societies directly connected to the real places of worldwide powers, production, and execution. Similarly, in the chapter Resistance of Opposition, the Palestinian critic probed the works of Césaire, Fanon, Nepal, James, Dubois, Yeats, Ahmad, and others, because in them he found the common experience of resistance against the imperial hegemony and the will to express a different narration of history. And as for the inquiry into the will to domination as a hegemonic realization of Western identity, it is then necessary to contrast the study of the will to resistance as historical narratives of the subaltern identities. And so it starts with the reciprocal influence between the imperial and subaltern cultures in order to delineate a massive net of exchanges and, <coughs> and moreover to show how every narrative, every fiction as well, cultural representation, it is a part of the entire historical process and not a unique point of view. Said so noticed how the resistance against imperialism was expressed as a re reaction to the intellectual consciousness which developed the historical becoming of such an hegemony <coughs> to claim an alternative way of conceiving human history, to write back to the metropolitan culture, and quoting from culture and imperialism, disrupting European narratives of the Orient and Africa, replacing them with either a more playful or a more powerful new narrative style. And Even after decolonization, the resistance against imperialism continued its historical process of constitutionalization to face the constant <coughs> pressures and pretensions of the many still unresolved political situation. This was because the texts and the careers which concurred with the constitution of political and cultural discourse of the former colonies were indeed informed by a profound wish of opposition, claim, and above all, reconstruction. Finally, what is the legacy of culture and imperialism? It has been a formidable beginning, an ansatz using the fundamental term that say borrowed from our part, for a contrapuntal analysis of our reality, a highly incisive demystification of the actual complexity of human civil society, 
thanks to its alternative and more compelling interpretation of literary, political, geographical, and historical texts. What Said really criticizes in regards to traditional literary criticism is the systematic anxiety towards self-fulfilled and self-referential planning, something which an athenic revolutionary model could easily <coughs> subsume and span. Instead, his humanistic <coughs> project of identity, like the literary conception which uh, lies underneath, must follow Peirce's abductive reasoning, generalizing from the known facts, hypothesizing new situation, and projecting forward, that is, forward towards a radically and humanly different future. Thus, this is not a mere recommendation for a micropolitan of critical praxis that revaluates the rule of the informal, of the unconventional, the dislocated with respect to the rituals and performances of the metropolitan homologated intellectual. On the contrary, it is the beginning of a different and more human endeavor. Said's criticism does not aim to simply review facts and sites for a better approximate interpretation of the truth, but it claims for a will to destroy a realization of the expressive possibilities of man a man profoundly interested in life. It is a passionate faith in the value of culture as a fundamental act of emancipation and enlightenment, a faith in human amelioration by aesthetic elevation and ethical struggle. However, it is a faith in a possibility that must not be presumed, but always intensely sought after, a synthesis of theoretical research and practical work for the constitution of a responsible awareness of the alpha reality. <coughs> so its humanism is not a mere tolerant instance. It is indeed a radical one, a universal, transcendent, design and transnational humanism. Uh, for the sake of humanity itself, it is always against the green, always against the hegemonic interest of homologation and subjugation, a truly human humanism. Thank you all. Thank you, Vincenzo, for this um, theoretical uh, 